Good afternoon and welcome to EGA's webinar, uh, Geothermal Energy Unlocking the Heat Beneath Our Feet, which has been kindly hosted by Surfy Energy Limited. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to leave people a couple of minutes just to log in uh, and then we'll make a start. As I said, I'll just leave some stragglers to uh, join and then we'll make a start. We do have people joining us from not only the UK, but uh, Europe, the Far East and the Americas as well. So we'll just give people just a, a few more moments to, to, to log in and then we'll make a start and introduce the panellists. Okay, the well, numbers have seemed to have stabilised there. So again, good afternoon, good evening, or even good morning, depending on where you are watching this webinar from around the world. Uh, today, thank you for joining one of our eager webinars, which has been kindly hosted and supported by Surfy Energy Limited, Geothermal Energy, Unlocking the Heat Beneath Your Feet. First, let me introduce Chris Sladen. Chris Sladen is a doctorate in geosciences at the University of Reading and has researched lake systems at economic importance for over 40 years. His contribution to energy and education has been recognised by the UK government with both an MBE and CBE, and also an Aztec Eagle from the Mexican government, the first foreigner, I might add, to actually receive this award. Uh, Chris is also chair of the newly formed Geothermal Energy Advanced Association. Chris, I'll hand over to you to introduce the rest of the panels. Thank you very much. Very good. Hello, everyone. And uh, hello to everyone around the world. Um, today's event is very much about the energy transition and uh, the impact of um, in, uh, during the production of energy on climate and climate change. And the event is about uh, geothermal energy and how geothermal energy can play a role, a leading role in this um, energy transition. I have with us three people from Serafi today uh, who I'm going to ask to give one or two minutes uh, perhaps no more than 60 seconds on who they are. And then I'm going to introduce our moderator for today's event. Um, so firstly, uh, Andy at Serafi, please say a few words. Sure, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, my name's Andy Wood. Uh, I am the subsurface manager at Serafi. I, uh, I come from oil and gas backgrounds. I, I gained a bachelor's degree in earth science uh, a long, long time ago. And then I moved into oil and gas and I spent 11 years working on rigs. Uh, that was followed by a move into uh, operations geology where I honed my skills and I, uh, I spent time focusing on operation optimization and cost saving. And uh, I've always been a very, very keen environmentalist, hence, hence my uh, move over to geothermal energy. Very good. Carl, 60 seconds from yourself. Hi, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Farrer. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Serafi and one of the co-founders of the business. And uh, like Andy, I've been in oil and gas for over 30 years now, uh, working all over the world um, in, in various projects, started off in drilling and really gone right through the, the sort of different areas of oil and gas onshore and offshore. Um, the last 10 years really been more involved in project risk mitigation and project funding and finance on some major projects around the world, primarily in Latin America and the Americas area. Um, and really, you know, six, seven years ago, gave me an exposure to geothermal in, in Mexico. And uh, that, that was a point which I really just thought that there's a huge benefit here and that, you know, we need to really try and uh, bring this to the forefront. So that's uh, hence why we um, established Serafi and moved forward in the last uh, few years as we have. Perfect, thanks, Carl. And finally, Martin, uh, 60 seconds about yourself, please. 
Yes, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Hinsky, and I'm the Chief Business Officer at Serapi Energy. My background is in economics, international relations, and oil and gas. Um, I worked at the permanent mission of the Slow Republic to the UN in Geneva. I was focusing on the Economic Commission for Europe and the Conference for Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Uh, I got into geothermal uh, for a Slovak company called GA Drilling, um, working on innovative ways of uh, developing plasma drilling for geothermal. And I spent the last 10 years looking at different sources of energy, whether it was nuclear, um, solar, wind, geothermal, oil and gas, and how these systems can work, the future, the role for their transition. And uh, here I am trying to get geothermal back on the menu, so to speak. Very good, thanks Martin. I'd now like to do, introduce the uh, moderator for the session, who is Beth. Beth uh, Suckling is at the University Technical College of Norfolk. And she's a 12th year student, which in the old style is sixth form. Uh, she's studying maths, uh, physics and engineering. Uh, she's very keen to explore a career in the renewable energy sector. Uh, and Beth is the recipi recipient of the prestigious Arkwright Engineering uh, Scholarship. And um, personally, I'm delighted this event uh, has turned the concept of, of a panel. Often you'd attend a panel and perhaps there'd be some students in the audience and we've turned that around and this time the moderator is a student. So uh, Beth, over to you, welcome to the event. Thank you, Chris. So I'm gonna dive straight in. I apologize for any background noise. I am currently in UTCN in one of our biggest classrooms in the workshop. So you've clearly all done your traveling. So what is the main thing you've learned about energy? Who would you like to answer that one? Is that for me, Beth, or for the whole panel? Anyone, Carl, would you like to answer? Yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, my mic was muted then, but uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, energy is obviously needed everywhere in the world. And, you know, it does vary from place to place. And obviously, we've got different levels of economic growth around the world. So, you know, some some are, have stable energy uh, supplies and others, others don't. And I think... Um, you know, oil and gas has obviously underpinned the, the globalization of, of travel and movement and freedom of movement and that over the years, um, which is great. And, you know, we can't um, knock that at all. And, you know, no one should be saying that oil and gas has not, the, you know, not done its job in the past. But I think, you know, from a globalization point of view, we, you know, we're just now, um, you know, realizing the impacts of um, some of the, the carbon effects around the world. And, you know, and it's obviously been more apparent uh, moving forward in the last few years. And, um, you know, it, that's making the, the energy needs, the energy differentiators around the world in, in different countries, um, different priorities. Um, some countries are able to do a transition quite quickly. Others are struggling. Um, you know, certainly island states and I have more problems to convert to clean energy than maybe other other landlocked uh, um, areas like Europe and places like that. So I think the energy mix varies from around the world. And I think we're going to see a big change generally in that over the, in the next few years. You know. Andy, would you like to expand on how geothermal is different from solar and wind energy? Absolutely. Um... I'm sorry, I only have a short amount of time, but I think the most, most important thing about geothermal energy is the fact that it is the greenest of energy sources. Um, we don't rely on any exotic minerals, for example, um, which is something that both wind and, and solar do. Um, we also have a very, very small uh, physical footprint if you want to build a wind or a solar farm, then they are going to take up very, very large areas of land, whereas uh, a geothermal well is drilled and then it's completed and a production facility goes on the top to produce either uh, heating and cooling or heating or cooling and uh, electricity. 
Um, and that can have a very, very small uh, footprint indeed, the size of uh, a domestic building. So uh, that's one of the main differences. Um, I, I, I think that, um, that really the, the fact that it can be uh, provided anywhere is also very important. Uh, any, anywhere you have an industry or a, a domestic uh, residential population, we can create a product for uh, either of those things. So yeah, it, it's, I, in, my, in my view, of course, which is biased, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very beneficial uh, energy source. I think, I think just to add to that, Andy, as well, is the, um, you know, ge geothermal provides certain base load elements to the energy mix, which, um, you know, are, are a lot more challenging for wind and solar. Um, but actually, you know, also, you know, we shouldn't be putting one energy against another energy in this um, process, you know, solar, wind, you know, geothermal, they all have their benefits. And I think it's more about using the, the right application for the right, you know, purpose. And where geothermal is significantly different in many respects is it's not just about power, it's also about using heat, which can then be used for things like cooling and, then, and, and other byproducts and other, you know, things that can come off the, uh, the geothermal cascade. And that's really what Seraphy is about, is really looking at the, the energy mix from, from geothermal and not just looking at the, the application of electricity, um, which we can get from other, other sources of renewables. Thank you. Martin, are there any environmental concerns with taking heat out of the ground and what is Seraphy doing to solve this issue? Oh, thanks, Beth. Um, well, as you probably know, conventional geothermal at least has been associated with uh, uh, creating maybe micro seismicity or seismicity that actually damage buildings uh, in several places. Uh, what we're trying to do is try to mitigate this using a closed loop system um, where we wouldn't have to stimulate the reservoir, you know, by injecting large amounts of uh, cold water, uh, potentially fracturing the uh, rocks and uh, releasing a lot of stress, rock stress that creates um, all those earthquakes. Um, and of course, we also had concerns regarding potentially con contaminating aquifers. Uh, once again, since we're looking at a closed loop system, um, then uh, we're trying to isolate aquifers and uh, we're trying not to circulate any downhole fluids, uh, so to speak. So yes, we are addressing this uh, environmental concern. Thank you. Do you. The geothermal industry is still tiny with 0.1% of the world's energy coming from geothermal source. Carl, why do you think it is that people aren't using this more, even though the technology has been around for thousands of years? Um, yeah, good question. And that's a question I initially asked and what got me really involved in, in this. Um, you know, it's... it's um, I think the key issue is, is it's really, um, it's, it, you know, it's really out of sight, out of mind. So because it's under the ground and it's not really something that, it, you know, people, most people can get access to without doing some major uh, um, intervention with drilling and stuff like that. Um, you know, the general uh, focus has been for many, many years now on wind and solar um and other forms but you know geothermal has been around as you rightly say for commercially since 1914 in italy and well used for hundreds and thousands of years behind that with chinese and all sorts of different um historical um uses um but the you know the the, the key the key here is um i think is really that you know we focused on other sources of easy energy in the oil and gas um, space which has really give us base load power um, and that's been the key. Um, and I think now we, we, we've learned a lot of lessons from oil and gas and continue to learn that. And that's really what's going to be the game changer in geothermal moving forward is, is taking that oil and gas experience that, that's been developed over 150 plus years now. Uh, we've drilled millions of wells in oil and gas. Every, every well has temperature and heat. And, um, you know, what we're doing differently now is we've spent nearly two years now doing a massive study on the elements of heat and uh, how, how that heat is um, can be used and what we do know is heat's everywhere um, aquifers and subsurface thermal systems aren't everywhere 
um, but um, you know they've, gen they've generally been commercialized where they've been um, accessible to date. And what we want to do is actually use the heat everywhere now and just introduce the water or the, the fluid systems into the heat to actually create the energy. So it's, it's really you know, taking that step now from being an anomaly around the world in certain locations or the theory of it can only be done in certain locations to the next level and engineering an approach to actually make it an anywhere solution. Thank you. Andy, how would you say the technology has changed to, for it to get to this point? And what steps are we going to need to take in the future in order for this technology to be more worldwide? You're muted, Andy. Do you beg your pardon? Uh, that, that's another good question. I think that um, the technology has changed, but, but something else that's changed is the focus. Um, we have, for example, now an oil and gas input into geothermal on, on a relatively large scale, um, and that has led to um, developments of closed loop systems, uh, like the one that, uh, that Martin's just spoken about. Uh, and that allows us to basically have geothermal energy just about anywhere. If you ask people about geothermal energy, they will usually tell you, yes, they have it in Iceland. Uh, and of course, that's, that, that's the case, but uh, it's always associated with hot places. So applying Serafi's closed loop technology and mitigating risk um, is, is a very, very large step ahead in the right direction. Um, and I, I think that, that going forward, what, what will change is that as companies like Serafi prove that geothermal energy can be produced absolutely anywhere, um, creating scalable systems, then other companies will begin to come on board. And that's what we really need. This isn't really just about Serafi becoming the largest company in the world. We need as many to come in as possible. We need them all to be successful because the, the energy dilemma is huge. Uh, and we just need, we need as much of it as possible. Could you expand on the risks of the procedure of actually getting the energy out of the ground? Uh, yeah, some, something that uh, Martin touched upon just now was the, uh, the secondary seismic activity, which is sometimes triggered. Uh, and that's associated with enhanced geothermal systems, whereby you drill two wells, uh, you pump water down uh, one well, and you harvest it from the second. Uh, now, because of the, the pressures and the very fast cooling related to uh, that water uh, being pumped into the ground, then earthquakes can be generated. Um, and in the case of Switzerland, for example, uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, local damage caused on the surface. Uh, the closed loop system that we have doesn't involve uh, any of that. We also, uh, because we're a closed loop single well system, then we don't have to frack in order to uh, connect those two wells, which is commonplace within the enhanced geo the geothermal systems. So we mitigate both of those, those risks. I think if I can I just um, add to that as well, um, I think the you know, other risks that potentially may, may not be environmental are obviously economical risks and uh, that type of thing. And you know, that's something else that we've focused a lot on is how to mitigate risk from a funding point of view to get projects scalable and, and move projects forward. Um, and obviously, if you can reduce the amount of drilling and reduce the amount of um, risk in that process, that also helps to um, de-risk the, the application um, considerably. Um, so we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time also looking at that side of it, really, to how, how to you know, increase investor and economic um, development um, appetite by reducing risk in, in the actual whole business model of, of geothermal, which is really important. Um, obviously, if you're looking to scale something, and as Andy mentioned, scale is, is, is a key to this and making modular systems uh, off, off the shelf type solutions uh, more pliable, um, obviously also reduces a lot of risk. Thank you, that's really interesting. That leads me on to my next question of what makes Serafi successful? Who do you want to answer that myself or? 
Yeah, you can answer that, yeah. Okay. Um, I think Andy touched on uh, that earlier and, you know, we, you know, we have a mandate as a company to, um, you know, deliver solutions to scale up clean energy, um, base load clean energy on a global platform. And, uh, you know, we, we also, you know, as Andy mentioned, you know, can't do that alone. Um, you know, we don't intend to do that alone. We, we intend to work with a wide partnership of collaborators and companies. And, and at the end of the day, ideally, um, with our technology and patent box is, is to bring out a, a, a combined load of solutions that everyone really can use, um, you know, making an impact on climate change, trying to help um, reduce carbon emissions and trying to get fossil fuels out of the energy um, base in general, you know, requires a massive effort from everyone. And it's some, certainly something that we're, you know, not trying to target on our own and moving forward, you know, we've, we've already struck up a lot of collaborative partnerships and, um, you know, we continue to do so. And, and, and I think, you know, our, our strength is in the knowledge that, you know, we need to do this collectively and we're not trying to do this exclusively. And we're, you know, we're learning every day. So, you know, we learn from working with the ground source heat pump sector. We learn from what we've already got from knowledge from oil and gas. And uh, so unlike some other industries, we're very much trying to connect the dots and learn from even aviation, how to make, you know, uh, generate turbines more efficient, whether they are, you know, used from aviation or whatever, and how to make things more cost effective. And I think that's really the key. In, in, in where we're focusing is to try and bring a different level of, um, shall I say, transparency, but at the same time, you know, connect the dots to make things actually accessible. We don't want to end up with a 20 year R&D project to try and get something off the ground. We need something that works tomorrow and using what we have off the shelf and, and make it work. Thank you for that. Martin, what would you say the current hopes are for Seraphy in geothermal? Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> You're okay. Beth, would you like to repeat the question? What are the current hopes for Seraphy in geothermal? Right. Um, so, what are the current hopes for Seraphy in geothermal? Where, uh, uh, I think as Carl touched upon this, we're trying to uh, provide a scalable solution, something we can do basically tomorrow without having to spend a lot of time in R&D. Um, and delivering geo from all everywhere. Uh, we don't want to focus only on hotspots. We want to find a solution to deliver mainly heat for you know, we have agriculture, heating, cooling, different processes, um, even in countries which do not have high geo from all gradients or hotspots, volcanic areas. So that's what we're trying to achieve as a company. Thank you. Andy, what makes Seraphy a place I would want to work? Uh, that's a, that's a really, that's a really uh, good question. Um, the thing that tempted me to, to Seraphy was uh, the mission. Uh, and to me, it, it, was, uh, it was something that I didn't really have to think about uh, because of the fact that there is such uh, an environmental focus on providing something that is so clean uh, and so important, but, but also the fact that, 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 um, that what we're doing is, is going to bring a huge amount of uh, employment, for example, from oil and gas. It's, it's, a, it's a great, great thing. Um, but actually physically working at Seraphy, I couldn't tell you, uh, primarily because I've never been to the office. I've been at the company now for three months and, um, uh, and, and that's it, you know. Um, the fact is that, that the, the mission of the company is, is what sold uh, everything to me as well as, of course, the, uh, the winning personalities of everybody I'm working with. 
Uh, but uh, it, it is a fantastic place to work. And I, I think also that the geothermal business is going to expand at a rate of knots over the next 10 years uh, and further, uh, I hope. But, uh, but there is going to be huge potential for career pro progression at Serafi and in, uh, and in geothermal generally. So Andy, what are the challenges you've faced? Obviously you're new to the industry and obviously with COVID, um, things haven't been running as normal. So what are the challenges you faced from that? Um, apart from the fact that I haven't been able to have a beer with Carl and uh, Ian and Martin and Pear and the rest of the team, um, th the challenges actually haven't been there at all. Um, the way that we're talking now means that, uh, that that meetings don't have to happen face to face. Um, and because of, because of that, um, communication has not been a problem. And of course, communication is a, a massive problem in many businesses. Um, but even, even though I haven't spent any time with the guys over the last three months, um, it, it, the business still um, works very, very effectively. We are forever talking to each other. We have regular meetings. If anybody has a question, um, then we're all very approachable. So I, I guess that kind of goes back to the last question you had about make it, why it's a, a, a nice place to work. Um, the fact is it's a very, very relaxed yet professional environment. Uh, so again, no challenges really. Thank you, that's a great answer. Carl, what would you say um, the skills, sorry, pardon me. Um, what are the skills needed to work in the geothermal industry? Did you find yourself transferring a lot of the skills you'd learned from oil and gas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, that's really what just um, struck me six, seven years ago now when I first had the opportunity to look at a geothermal its project um, in detail um, is just how much connectability there is between the oil and gas industry and the geothermal um, business itself. Um, and I think, you know, generally geothermal has been treated very much like a bit of a science project around the world. You know, people have done it where there's natural faults, natural systems, and uh, and just really experimented with these systems to actually get energy out of them. I and mean, as you mentioned, there's less than a, around 15 gigawatts in the world globally, which is really nothing um, considering the, the potential. Um, I think, you know, it connects the dots to everything in oil and gas, um, you know, from supply chain, from manufacturing, um, from the drilling side of it, from the geology side of it, from the exploration, from the project management, from the, you know, fabrication and delivery of systems and modules and equipment. Um, everything's connected. And, um, you know, I, I actually do think that, you know, this is a space that is probably the closest transition or any clean energy transition that um, oil and gas has um, far, far, far um, more accessible than solar and wind and, and things like that from a, from a major aspect of um, creating a transitional energy space. I, I look at it more like an evolution. It's like, you know, evolving from, you know, oil and gas into, into a still doing oil and gas, but be able to do something else evolving into a, a clean energy um, solution. And when we talk about transition and energy, remember, we're, we're, we're primarily talking about decarbonisation of, of energy, i.e. the use of energy. We're still going to need, you know, fills for and oils and gases from, from many other things we use every single day. So, you know, we're not talking about replacing oil and gas and we never will do. We, we can't replace oil and gas. We have to use oil and gas for, for certain aspects. So. Thank you for that, that's a great question. I'm gonna take my next question over to Andy. Would you say this technology could be used on Mars? Because this is actually quite a big thing at the moment um, with the development and the possibility of actually one day us colonizing Mars. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's an unexpected question, uh, but of course the answer is yes. Um, as, as, long as, as long as the planet has a, a hotter subsurface than, than surface, then yes. Um, and, and of course it will do. Um, so the technology can be used on Mars. Uh, and if there's any water there, we could probably help them uh, create desalination for it as well. Thank you. It's a good answer to a tricky question. Martin, so 
how deep do these wells have to be in order to actually extract the heat and how much would it cost? Thanks, Beth. Um, it really depends on the location. As I mentioned, there's uh, different geothermal gradients for uh, each of the locations we look at. Um, you know, you can have heat with heat pumps. You can have just, uh, um, you know, heat directly. So that's drilling to reach 120 degrees Celsius, maybe 140 for direct heating. Uh, if you want power generation, you probably need to drill deeper. So you could be talking between, you know, three to five kilometers in hotter areas. Um, areas with lower geothermal gradients, you could be drilling up to six kilometers to vertical depth. Um, so it really depends on the local, you know, subsurface conditions, the geothermal gradient, heat flow. Uh, but uh, typically wells have been drilled, geothermal wells have been drilled three to five kilometers. You know, just in the UK, we have United Downs drilled to, I think it was 5,200, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the cost really depends on what you drill into. So the geology, um, uh, you know, the harder the rock, um, you know, the, the higher the wear and tear on bits uh, will be. Obviously, you'll have to do more tripping, and then your rig rates will also influence this. So, uh, we could be talking anything between, you know, six to 14 million per well. Um, so, that's more or less the indicative cost for geothermal wells. But um, as you know, out of these uh, companies, the technology companies are developing uh, more resistant bits, uh, hammer bits, there's plasma drilling, uh, there's a lot of innovative companies out there and even improvements in the current technology has been used in oil and gas. So, um, you know, there's this uh, carryover between oil and gas and geothermal in terms of drilling experiences and tools. That's brilliant. So Martin, what would you say um, an average well, how many houses would that potentially power? Uh, right. Uh, so based on the UK, I think the average household consumes uh, 3000 kilowatts per year. That's three megawatts. Um, typically a producer, geothermal producing can produce between three to five megawatts. Uh, some even higher depends on the location. But um, yeah, I mean, you can power several thousands of households uh, with just one producer, five megawatt producer. Thank you. Now, Carl, what would you say to a young person like myself to persuade them to go into the geothermal industry? I think uh, I wouldn't just say geothermal, but just energy in general. And I think, you know, it's an industry in general, energy, you know, certainly from the oil and gas perspective, moving into energy that, you know, is can take you all over the world i've lived in 12 different countries over my life and i've sort of traveled all over the different um the, the world probably in every location there's there's energy to be extracted over 30 years um certainly visited a lot of places so ability to speak languages ability to learn different cultures and stuff like that so i think you know beyond the energy side there's a huge potential there um to travel and uh, be engaged in uh, innovative solutions and projects um so I think, you know, it's really it's a really interesting space. Every day is different. Every day is um, unique. Um, meet some great people, you know, great companies, great innovation and technology. And uh, it's, it's a great place to be. I mean, if, if you if you if you want a diverse um, potential career that you can change um, literally by the week, if you want it to, um, it's a great place to be. And, you know, we definitely need more and more. Um, you know, young generation in the in the in the industry, and you know we're trying to make to be a better to a, for a better phrase, we're trying to make you know energy a lot more sexy and the place to be. You know, we want it to we want it to be cool. We want the you know the place to you know we want the energy sector to be you know something looked at as being the cool place to be working in, uh, and that's really why we're trying to sort of bring a different spin to the to the business a little bit. And, and make it a place to attract younger generation and younger people. And as a company, we're very people focused anyway. So we have set the company up to be 
very people people focused. Uh, most of our owner or most of our employees are shareholders as well, and we share, share schemes up. So we're trying to attract the generations, the younger generation, into the business. So, Carl, that's the downsides. What stops it from being a sexy place to be? <laughs> um, I think just a misconception of um, you know what engineering and oil and gas and energy is i think you know just people don't see it as being a, a place to be now it's people you know i think um you know being able to travel being able to get out of an office being able to go have different you know locations each day or each each week you know i think these are the things that you know we're trying to make people aware of and make um you know the younger generation really aware of that there's there's you know this is also a, a, an industry you can very much very easily multitask and move from this industry into other industries, you know, quite quite um, quickly if you've got an engineer and a skills background in in this sector. So, I um, mean, this you know, from from being an electrician, for example, you know, working on an oil and gas platform or working on a geothermal plant, you know, tomorrow you could be installing electrical systems in somebody's house. So, you know, they're, they're skills that can be transferred across multitudes of different industries. And I think, you know, this is where I think we've lost the connection in that to many respects um i think we're start, slowly getting it back but i think you know we can do a lot more and, and and companies can do a lot more to try and attract um younger people into the industry i think and and you know a lot of it goes on but i, I still don't think there's enough you know. thank you so leading on from this andy you mentioned how you don't even in the company for three months and haven't actually been in the office what does an average day for you look like uh, the great thing about my job is that there isn't an average day. Um, it, it, every day is different. Um, I, I spend a lot of time um, looking into how, um, how subsurface solutions from oil and gas can be uh, moved into the geothermal sphere. Um, because of my background, I'm also always looking for optimization in those processes. Um, I'm looking at how we can fine tune some of the oil and gas um, processes and make them uh, either work for us or maybe we could just take them out and not use them at all. Um, one of the things I also do is, so in, in that process, I meet with a lot of service companies, uh, maybe uh, you know three or four a week. I'll also, I also spend some time um, pr uh, presenting to societies, uh, particularly about um, geothermal and the energy transition. I'm a great proponent of, of trying to encourage people from oil and gas to move into geothermal. Um, at Serafi, we're, we're also members of, um, founding members of the Geothermal Energy Advancement Association. And, and through that then, I may spend a little bit of time uh, working on, on, uh, on things for them. Um, we'll also have, we have internal meetings to attend, um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of, that's kind of it. Um, apart from trying to learn more and, uh, and then communicate with, uh, outside companies and guys within the company. And leading on from this, what challenges do you face on a daily basis? Do you find that the um, environment you're dealing with to be tricky at all, or the area and the council you may be dealing with are posed to be a challenge to you? Uh, no, I, I, I think um, if I understood that question right, I think that most people are kind of um, are encouraging as far as geothermal energy is concerned. Um, there is such a focus on alternative energy at the moment and one that offers a zero carbon dioxide uh, solution is, is being welcomed by everybody. So I, I don't think that there, there are uh, challenges as far as uh, persuading people that geothermal energy is, is a good solution. Thank you. 
So Martin, what area would a geothermal cover, a geothermal plant cover? Because like windmills, they need a large amount of space. But how, what is the radius of a, a hole? Sorry, I think my connection didn't work for a while. Um, so typical power plant, if that's what I am doing, um, you could have it on maybe 100, 100 meters squared. And I believe your second question was um, the borehole size. Sorry. My question was, how wide are the holes usually? Maybe, maybe I'll take that one. Um, the, uh, the, at at the, uh, the, the surface, um, the, the hole would start off as, let's say, 36 inches, three feet. Um, and then ideally we would, we would aim for that hole to be as large as possible at the total depth of the well. So let's say we drill to, let's say we drill to um, five kilometers, then by the time we got down to five kilometers, if we could, we would want to finish that in about a 12 and a quarter inch section. Um, and uh, as, as Martin mentioned, the, the footprint of the, the well pad might be hundred meters, but when we move away, uh, it, the actual uh, surface facility for a small uh, project could be uh, the size of uh, a domestic garage, let's say. Thank you. And expanding on from this, obviously we want to get as much power as possible into people's homes. So if we were to use geothermal as a instead of wind power or solar panel on people's houses, how easy would it be to be in, install the cables? Because obviously the house has already been built and how easy would the cabling fit into that? There is some infrastructure work that needs to be done. Um, district heating requires uh, piping um, and, uh, and that does involve um, some initial upheaval. Um, but basically it's, it's uh, digging holes in, in the ground as, as you would have uh, any utility company coming in. Um, so it's only initial disruption, but the great thing is that once a, a geothermal well is in place, you can pro produce that heating uh, for a very, very long time. And because uh, at Serafi we have closed loop systems, then our wells will also last a long time. So um, once everything is has been uh, installed and that initial trouble and uh, inconvenience is, uh, is forgotten, then uh, the heat from a geothermal well uh, can say last 50 to 100 years um, without having uh, any need for maintenance before you have to go in and do some, something uh, else to it. But um, the great thing about it, uh, you're comparing it to, to wind and solar, um, as Carl has already mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's a base load uh, solution, uh, which means that it is uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Um, and if you have a, a one megawatt plant and, and it starts producing one megawatt, then that's what it, uh, it produces through its life. So, so that's, a, that's a definite asset. If you compare it to offshore wind, for example, um, offshore wind in the UK has a 40% efficiency rate. So there are definite, definite advantages to, uh, to geothermal energy. Thank you, Andy. So expanding on from that, Carl, what would you say the limitations are? We've covered a lot of the advantages, but there must be limitations to this process. Yeah, I think um, limitations today really go to the point of um, really people just being aware of the capacity of what can be achieved out of it. And I think at the moment, you know, as I mentioned earlier, most of the focus is, um, is on the, the low hanging fruit accessible, you know, wind and solar options, which are, you know, readily available around us and uh, everyone can sort of reach for them anywhere. 
um, you know, and also I think, you know, political uh, influence and government um, understanding of, of really where heat plays into the mix um, and can be used more efficiently is key to actually driving the, the geothermal side forward. Um, at the moment, you know, the, if you take the UK, the government's approach is very much to electrify heat. Um, or to find a solution with something like, you know, blue hydrogen, which is OK, but it's still coming from a fossil fuel um, background in, in some respects. So, you know, where heat can play a massive part in the process from geothermal is that, you know, we use at least 30 to 40 percent of our energy in electricity is used for some form of conversion to heat or on the other side to cooling. Um, so, you know, there are. I think a lot of um, downsides at the moment in people's perception and uh, and also the, the way geothermal is conventionally being done as to the way it can be done or should be looking at being done. Um, you know, we are getting more towards microgrids and the thought talks about microgrids and microgrid solutions. Um, and our focus is very much looking at um, modular, scalable, plug and play solutions rather than you know, large plants in the middle of a country and, you know, tens of thousands of kilometres of distribution transmission systems, which effectively is redundant infrastructure. Um, you know, we need to start getting away from that so you don't end up like problems like Texas had in February where half the you know state was shut down because of transmission systems shutting down and things like this. So if you put energy where people need it um, and you have multiple power sources there in smaller chunks, it becomes a lot more manageable. And uh, at the end of the day, the customer and the end user gets more um, benefit out of it. And effectively, it's a lot more manageable if you need to decommission and shut down or you need to change something. It's very, it's become more economical to do it you know? or even scale up in many respects. You know? Thank you for that, Carl. A very nice answer. On to Mark, Martin. Before this is my final question before handing over to Chris. How long, how long is the process of actually getting the plumbing off the well to be able to actually dig? Thanks, Beth. Um, unfortunately, Derek Walter cannot be here today with us regarding uh, drilling. Um, but uh, you know, you need to mobilize the rig, prepare the pad. That may take uh, a couple of months. And the actual drilling will depends how deep you drill. You could be talking between three to six months per well. But uh, if Andy wants to add anything to this, uh, no. Uh, of course, there's some some upfront planning, um, but uh, that that kind of sums it up. So I, I think that's uh, that's a fair summary. I think just to add to that, I think um, you know one of the things that. You know, we have looked at a lot and we're, we're actually doing this now is the repurposing of existing wells. So, you know, where, you know, a lot of focus has always been on drilling wells. You know, we have millions of wells around the world that potentially carry, you know, a vast amount of liability, both for the oil and gas operators and for the potential even governments in many respects, if the wells are left and uh, a company that has them ownership um, is not able to complete them wells properly after, after the production. So, you know, our, the ability to try and use the heat from existing wells, which we know is there, and there's a lot of data on every single well that's been drilled generally, um, because logging is part of the process and that data is, is available. Um, you know, we can actually use a lot of these wells for energy. So being able to use existing wells to produce um, clean energy, or in many cases, even during production to use the wells and use the heat in the well, for example, with our CoPro well solution is to actually, you know, produce clean energy from the heat in the well, which then helps to decarbonize the footprint of the operational operational site. And whilst you're producing um, oil and gas or hydrocarbons, as well as obviously looking at the reusing that well once the field has been depleted. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot of benefit in, um, in trying to use the infrastructure we already have. And that goes also for things like coal-fired, gas-fired power plants or any infrastructure that already exists that needs maybe decommissioning in fossil fuel sense could also be repurposed um, if we look at it properly um, to use for the application of geothermal. So actually repurposing the existing infrastructure with geothermal energy to actually use that um, existing transmission and distribution system 
to actually um, you know, carry on using it for clean energy. And these are things that we've currently looked at and we've done a lot of modeling and studying on this. And you know, I think these are definitely things that we'll be involved, we'll be, be doing you know, very shortly and in the near future. Thank you all, that's all my questions. I've definitely learned a lot. So thank you for answering my questions in such great detail. I'm definitely gonna go away and tell all my peers I think I'm definitely a bit like a professional in this now. <laughs> I know a lot. Um, so I'll hand over to Chris. Uh, very good, Beth. Thank you. And uh, Beth, do stay with us. There's time uh, for perhaps three or four more questions. Uh, many questions have been sent in. And I, I'd like to start with a question, which Carl, you, you touched upon this. Um, in Texas, there was a major power outage. And this power outage also had um, um, catastrophic impact on Mexico as well, um, regarding uh, natural gas supply and power interconnection. Um, and yet Texas is a place with one and a half million oil and gas wells. Um, many, many wind farms, solar, solar farms too. Um, could geothermal, Carl, could geothermal have solved the problem in, in Texas and Mexico? Um, it's hard to say solve the problem. I mean, but, you know, geothermal certainly has its place in, in, uh, in Texas and anywhere else. Um, you know, Texas has great thermal gradients in, uh, in the Permian Basin and are certainly around the, around the coastal areas. And, you know, we're currently looking at a number of sites and projects around there for, re, for repurposing and development um, as we speak. Uh, I think, you know, it's like everything else, this, this you know, you, you can't have one of everything. You've got to have a blended mix. And I also think, you know, coming back to my previous question or previous answer is, um, you know, we need to get away from these large um, distribution and uh, networks and um, transmission systems and more localized energy, putting energy where, it, where it's needed. Uh, and I think geothermal definitely has a place in that space. It's, you know, to be able to stick energy where it's needed. And, uh, and when we talk about energy, not just looking at power, because everyone seems to be looking at power at the moment or when we've talked about energy and there's a significant, um, you know, benefit in just using heat. Um, if you create, you know, use the benefit of heat. So you re remove the need to use um, uh, large amounts of electricity for heat, which is what, you know, it wasn't electricity um, failing in, in Texas that killed most of the people it was the ability not to be able to heat their homes and people dying because they didn't have heat so you know heat is a big issue and um and i think it's going to get worse as we move forward in the climate change you know whether you believe it or not you know as we do go through these processes we're seeing hotter summers colder winters and you know seasons shifting um in places where you don't you need heat or cooling things are changing you know so we need to focus on the heat and focus on more micro solutions or off-grid solutions, which can be scalable and, and geothermal as that place, you know. Very good, thanks, Carl. And uh, another question that came in was around dissolved minerals um, in geothermal waters. I think often uh, people have looked at them for the possibility of lithium. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about the added value of minerals uh, from geothermal waters? Um, I can say a bit, but I think Andy's probably better qualified on the subsurface. But I mean, I, I, you know, my in, in our in our solution, you know, we we developed our therapy well to be a closed loop system, um, and really de-risk the drilling process. So un, unlike um conventional uh, geothermal approach where you drill exploratory wells generally or test wells uh, and, and in many cases some of them fail in, and you can't get permeability and uh, you know that's dead money that's been sunken into a, to a, a drilling program that's potentially non-recoverable uh, what our seraphy well does is be able because it just uses the heat and not the, not the thermal system is is to be able to create a commercial value out of any well um, so what we would always approach is to drill a seraphy well However, if we did stumble across a, an actual thermal system in the in the process of drilling a seraphy well um, with the right readings, we would actually then develop that commercial um, approach. So, um, 
and, and yeah, there are the ability to extract minerals in, in certain locations, as you know, Cornish Lithium and other companies are doing. Um, and I don't know whether Andy wants to add anything to that. But. Not really, Carl. Um, I, th I think it's becoming more widely known that you can, uh, you can use geothermal wells for um, particularly lithium extraction. And mm. that, that's actually, if you find the right location, it can be incredibly uh, profitable. Mm. Yeah, we have. So we are looking at some program projects in in South Africa where gold and other things are being looked at, and even diamond extraction and things like this. So there's, you know, there are there are a lot of people talking about it. It's certainly, it's certainly not the front of our um, business plan at the moment is to look at um, extracting minerals. It might be a sideline thing in the future moving forward. Yes, understood. It can be a byproduct which which adds value. Um, uh, a technical question uh, was about the status of uh, plasma drilling and laser drilling techniques. Um, is it, uh, perhaps a 30 second answer on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, not, not to um, sort of be in any sort of breach of previous confidentiality agreements, etc. But I mean, you know, we, we, I still have some vested interest in uh, what GA drilling are doing. And, uh, you know, there is a, a, a great future in that technology and obviously a great need in the technology if we can, uh, if it can um, be commercially applied, um, which I think it will be at some point. And like everything else, it's, you know, one of these things, it's a, this is not a small step change. This is a massive step change in, in the technology approach, which, um, which plasma drilling is trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, there's a lots of lots of challenges, and um, you know the guys are doing a great job, as you know, um, of you know, really, you know, breaking breaking ground effectively in an area which hasn't changed for well over 100, 150 years. The drilling industry's very changed very little in its approach. It's still, you know, force on bit, torque, and everything else. And I think you know, yes. hammer drilling or anything else that um, comes around is is really. Uh, the, the future, yeah. Very good. Um, well, it brings brings us to the last question and wrap up. Um, there are two questions that are linked. One is um, was asking to talk a little bit about the um, Geothermal Energy Advancement Association that Andy had mentioned, and I guess I'm best placed to answer that question. Um, but when I asked for final remarks, the uh, the, for, for each of you, the question is, if you had 60 seconds to pitch geothermal to Boris Johnson, what would you say? Um, so I'll give you a, uh, a couple of minutes to think about that. Um, let, in the meantime, let me explain the Geothermal Energy Advancement Association is a cross academic uh, industry, industry body um, which is designed to add to current efforts in uh, the geothermal area um, with a specific focus on advocacy and for advocacy to get a, a, uh, a better understanding of, of geothermal and how investment in geothermal can help reduce uh, dependency, particularly on hydrocarbons. Um, the Association is, is not attempting to replace any other of the various associations that, that exist. It, it's trying to add to the effort. Uh, as was mentioned during this seminar, uh, wind and solar uh, are taking by far the largest part of, uh, of, of renewable energy uh, additions. And I believe there's a very strong case for geothermal. To, to be um, adding much, much more than it, it currently does. If we look last year, I think solar and wind each added many tens of gigawatts of new power capacity, whereas geothermal was down a few tens or, or 100 megawatts. So much, much lower. Um, and yet it has a very low footprint. It doesn't require the wind to be blowing or the sun to be shining. Um, so there's many advantages that uh, geothermal could bring. 
Uh, we've launched the association. It's a fledgling association, uh, which we plan to uh, develop as an advocacy body in coming months. Um, to wrap this end, event up, uh, the final question is, so what's your one minute pitch to Boris Johnson? And I think we're running out of time. So let's make it 30 seconds each, Carl. I think, I think the important thing comes always down, and this isn't Boris Johnson, this is every country around the world and every leader is, you know, we need to be getting towards an energy independence um, process internally. Uh, I don't, you know, we've been, a, we've built a massive um, energy sector around oil and gas over the last uh, 50 to 60 years. Uh, I just think the route we're going down with electrification and trying to push everything down the route of um, solar and wind, uh, with even hydrogen playing some role in that moving forward, is just uh, somewhat uh, playing into a, an energy failure moving down the line, you know, because we, most of that infrastructure is coming from abroad. Uh, technology that we don't create and develop in the UK and I think you know we need to be getting hold of our oil and gas business and uh, making sure that we can transfer the skills and the knowledge from that industry um, into something which will give us baseload power and energy uh, which also becomes an exportable um, value for the for the country at the end of the day and that's my very good answer. very good and a final comment from yourself very quickly Sure. Um, if, if, if I was given a minute with Boris Johnson, I think I would show him uh, a geothermal heat map of the UK, uh, yes. which, which shows that uh, just about anywhere in the UK uh, can be used uh, to, to generate electricity from geothermal sources. And those places that can't be, and there are very few, um, can in turn be used for uh, heating and cooling solutions, whether that's for industry or or for residential housing. Very good. Martin, a final quick comment. Well, let's use geothermal for uh, district heating over the UK. You know, let's uh, use natural gas for something else, export it. Uh, geothermal is affordable. There's no CO2 emissions will help the UK reach net zero by 2050. Um, and let's use uh, other sources as wind, offshore wind, uh, solar, nuclear for power generation. And let's use geothermal for heating, which makes sense in cooling and agriculture. Very good. Uh, it's for me to bring the event to a close. Let me close by uh, firstly saying that uh, membership of the Geothermal Energy Advancement Association is open to everybody. Uh, for most people, there's no cost at all. You can find us on LinkedIn and watch out for other messages related to that. Uh, Carl, Martin, Andy, thanks for all your comments today. Uh, Beth, absolutely great job as uh, moderator. And thank you to the University Technical College in Norfolk. I'd also like to thank all those people behind the scenes that helped this event uh, happen, uh, particularly Sophie, Sophie Skip, uh, Celia Anderson, I know is there. Uh, Marie and Rob at the East, uh, East of England Energy Group. Rob, I'm, I'm going to hand it back to you now. Thank you so much, Chris. You kind of stole my thunder there by doing what I was going to do. <laughs> but no, I'd just like to thank everyone that spoke today. And Beth, a special focus to you and massive applause. Well done. You really asked some really good questions. I know it's your first time doing this kind of thing, so you really did a fantastic job. And there's been lots of really positive comments for what you did, so thank you for doing that. Uh, for everyone that's called in today, that does bring the end of this uh, webinar on geothermal. Please do look out on the Eager Events page for up more webinars coming up. Our next one's going to be the middle of May with the DIT looking at Virginia Beach. Uh, we are then going to be hosting another Seraphy uh, webinar later on in the year on July the 7th. So please look out for those dates. And as I said, do check out the website for any of the events that might be coming up. So for everyone that's called in today, for our speakers, Beth, everyone else, thank you so much. Have a very good afternoon, evening, or the rest of the day, wherever you are around the world. Goodbye. <laughs>